good afternoon or still good morning, depending on where you are located. I can see also Loriana is online. Perfect. Um, so this is the session on funding markets. So the first paper is about hedge fund and the treasury cash future uh, disconnect. Uh, Jay Khan from the OFR will present it. Uh, please uh, go ahead and share your, uh, your screen. So thanks very much to the organizers, to Angela and to, to Loriana in advance for her discussion. Um, I'm happy to be presenting this paper today titled uh, Hedge Funds and the Trash Treasury Cash uh, Futures Disconnect. This is joint work with Danny Barth, who's at the Board of Governors. I'm at the OFR, and so this has to come with the usual disclaimers that these views are ours and not those of our respective employers. So the background of this paper is going to be in the extreme disruption in treasury markets experienced in March of 2020, when if we look at the figure on the left, we saw uh, option implied volatility in treasury markets, if anything, higher than it was during the financial crisis. And if we look on the figure uh, on the right, uh, we saw signs of rising illiquidity across a broad range of different maturities of treasuries, and this is in terms of their bid-ask spreads. So uh, during the peak of this illiquidity, we estimate that hedge funds sold over $200 billion worth of treasuries. And what, one of the things that we do in this paper is document that this is part of a broader shift as hedge fund treasury exposure increased by almost a trillion dollars between 2017 and 2019. If we look at the figure in the center here, we're seeing that the flows these hedge funds were doing were similar in size to more traditional fl uh, flows uh, from holders of treasuries like pension funds and uh, banks. So in this paper, we're gonna be asking three questions. First, why were hedge funds holding so many treasuries going into March? Second, why did they sell so many treasuries during March? And finally, what if anything were the consequences of this for broader treasury market functioning? So what we are going to show you in this paper is that over 70% of this trillion dollar change in treasury exposures can be associated with a fundamental disconnect between the cash and futures prices of treasuries. And in particular, that during this period, treasury uh, futures became overvalued relative to a replicating portfolio of cash securities. In order to show you that, we're gonna be relying on a mixture of public aggregates and some regulatory microdata to link this trade to hedge funds. Uh, and in particular, the trade that these guys were doing was known as the cash futures basis trade, which involves long positions in cash treasuries, short positions in treasury futures, and substantial borrowing in the repo market. And both because of the substantial size of this trade amongst hedge funds and because of the links it forms between these crucial markets, we think it's important to understanding treasury market functioning more broadly, as well as money markets. Now, um, you know, in the full model, we're going to, or in the full paper, we present a model that explains the roles that treasuries that hedge funds were playing in broader treasury market functioning during this period, where they were serving as sort of warehouses for treasuries, taking them off of the balance sheets of dealers and facilitating risk sharing with asset managers uh, through this trade. Now, crucially, hedge funds weren't able to act as perfect warehouses because they're exposed to two sources of risks when running this trade. The first is uh, margins on their uh, futures contract, and the second is volatility in the repo market. And what happened in March of 2020 is that both of these risks materialized, and we find that hedge funds sold, and hedge funds involved in this trade sold almost $100 billion worth of treasuries, so roughly half of the total. Now, uh, we're gonna discuss then some of the consequences this may have had for treasury market functioning uh, when we get there. So, to start with what we think was the fundamental driver of this disconnect, uh, we're going to talk about the relationship between uh, cash and futures prices of treasuries. And in principle, these two things should be related. I can either buy a treasury today, or I can enter into a treasury futures contract today that will deliver me the treasury at some point in the future. Now, uh, because the futures contract in general doesn't pay me money today, uh, the futures price and the cash price should differ by the fact that I have to wait for that uh, contract to eventually pay off. But what we're showing you in the figure on the left here is actually that there is a convergence between these futures and cash prices as the delivery date approaches. And what our arbitrage restriction is going to impose here is that that convergence occurs at the rate of, of 
solely at the rate of time preference, which we're going to represent by a, a bill, since these are both essentially risk-free contracts. So what we do in the paper is establish an empirical uh, counterpart to this uh, general relationship you see in the center between treasury cash and futures prices using cash prices from CRISP, futures prices from Bloomberg, and a whole host of rules about how these contracts settle. And what we're showing you in the figure on the top right is actually uh, the disconnect in that relationship over time. In particular, uh, what we can see is that that disconnect has been increasing. The blue line here has been going above the uh, above zero, which implies that futures have been overvalued relative to uh, uh, treasury cash securities. Now, um, you know, an arbitrage relationship like this, it doesn't just hold by magic. Someone has to actually go out and trade it. So in practice, the way that this relationship between cash and futures prices is enforced is through a trade known as the cash futures basis trade. In particular, uh, basis traders are going to go you know, long the undervalued security, that's the cash treasury, short the undervalued security, that's the treasury futures contract, and they have to make a cash outlay today. So they're going to meet that by substantial borrowing in the repo market. In particular, they're going to borrow against the treasury for which the cash and futures prices actually converge, which is known as the cheapest to deliver treasury. And it's a, a, that convergence we show is somewhat unique across different treasuries. Now, crucially, instead of borrowing to the delivery date, in general, we find that basis traders tend to borrow largely overnight, and that's going to expose this trade to one source of risk, which is the rate on those repo that they're doing might rise. And they're exposed to a second source of risk through the short position on their futures contract, which involves margin calls, potentially, um, which could cause a sudden cash outlay. Well, that risk is going to be compounded by in the fact that, in principle, the leverage on this trade is limited only by the haircut on Treasury collateral, which is 2% and would imply a leverage of 50 to 1. Now, in addition to sort of laying out the risk that this trade involves, we also can get a sort of stereotypical picture of what a, a basis trader's balance sheet should look like here. They should have large, long cash positions, matched short futures positions, and substantial borrowing in the repo market against the cheapest to deliver it to fund the trade. So what we're showing you here is using some micro data from the SEC's form PF that uh, to argue that uh, the balance sheets of hedge funds actually look quite a lot like that stereotypical picture. And in particular, if we look at the figure on the left here, we're seeing a large increase in both long and short exposures from PF. That's both of which are to the tune of around $500 billion. Now, PF mixes cash and derivatives exposure, so it could be that some of these are treasury futures. And so to sort that out, we uh, also include data from the CFTC's commitment of traders data. And that allows us to say that the majority of these long positions are actually in cash securities, while the majority of these short positions are actually in treasury futures. And so, um, you know, that helps to uh, make this uh, picture uh, match the uh, what we think of as the stereotypical balance sheet. They are indeed going long the undervalued asset and short the overvalued asset. If we look at the figure on the right, we're seeing the third leg of this trade, which is their borrowing in the repo market. And we can see that that borrowing also increased during this period by about $500 billion. And you know, one thing that's very nice is that we can show that this net repo borrowing that hedge funds were doing actually correlates very well with the spread between cash and futures prices that we report uh, before. Now, um, you know, all of this is aggregated statistics. So, you know, to dig a little deeper into this, we go through and classify some hedge funds as large basis traders um, based on how close they are to that story, stereotypical balance sheet of a basis trader. And we find that in 2019, about 60% of hedge fund gross treasury exposure, or around $700 billion, uh, was associated with these large basis traders and basis traders made up 505 billion or 94 percent of net repo borrowing and just to put that in context especially for this group that's focused on money markets that would make up about 30 percent of primary dealer repo lending against treasuries in the u.s now another thing that's crucial to assessing the risks of this trade are that basis traders have a median leverage about 18 to 1 and an average leverage of 21 to 1. I don't love always making comparisons to LTCM here, but you know, some back of the envelope con 
um, calculations, LTCM had a leverage about 25 to 1. So, you know, if you just take the median leverage and average leverage that we report, you could believe that the average leverage or the uh, highest leverage among basis traders was about 25 to 1, so the same size. But in order to believe that, you'd have to believe that roughly half of the basis traders were that levered. And your alternative is to believe that there were some funds doing this trade that were substantially more levered than LTCM ever was. Now, unfortunately, the uh, uh, statistics that Form PF reports, they're all aggregated. We can't see any security level information here. And so to get some more info on this trade, we turn to some data that's specific to the OFR, which is our collection of data from the repo markets that actually uh, includes hedge funds borrowing. In particular, there are only two uh, repo markets in the US where hedge funds borrow. There's the uncleared bilateral uh, space, and there's also a cleared um, service provided by the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation known as DVP. And hedge funds are allowed to participate in this through the sponsored borrowing uh, segment of that market. Uh, what we're using is transaction level data on that segment, and we've mapped it by hand to hedge funds, and it provides us a lot of detail on collateral rates and counterparties. And the reason that this data is particularly important to us, it's not going to be too surprising to this audience, is that these markets are pretty segmented. And in particular, there's about a 10 basis point spread between the rate that money market funds get in DVP, so that's the rate they lend at, and the rate at which hedge funds borrow. And so that makes getting the specific data on hedge funds very important. So when we look at DVP repo positions, we can actually get some more information that's consistent with large basis trading. And in particular, if we look at the treasuries that are deliverable into futures contracts, there's a lot more volume uh, in repo collateralized with those deliverable treasuries than in other non-deliverable treasuries. And the highest position that we see of any uh, hedge fund positions during this period is actually in the cheapest to deliver treasury. That's this little green dot right here. That position is about 4.5 billion or about 10% of outstanding, which is surprising given that, you know, EVP repo, clear repo is only likely to be a fraction of total repo borrowing. And we also see that position decrease right after the first delivery date of the, um, of the, uh, uh, futures contract, which is again, consistent with large basis trainings amongst treasury uh, hedge funds. Now, um, you know, to put this in the context of broader treasury market functioning, uh, we present a, a model that I'm not gonna go into detail on, but I'll, I'll give you some of the broad takeaways. So, you know, in particular, the, the question that we're trying to answer is what role hedge funds are playing in the market by doing this trade. And what we, you know, come up with is that hedge funds are acting as warehouses for treasuries. So in particular, they're taking them off of the hands of traditional holders of treasuries and off their balance sheets, funding them through repo um, uh, markets, and then eventually delivering them to the futures market. So what they're doing in effect is taking them both off the balance sheets of dealers and facilitating some risk sharing on the part of um, asset managers who hold the majority of long treasury futures positions in this market. But crucially, you know, as we've pointed out, this trade is exposed to risks and those risks prevent hedge funds from being perfect warehouses for treasury. So there's a very simple limits to arbitrage story here. And when those uh, risks materialize, in particular, when margin constraints rise or when repo markets become tighter, there can be a sudden decrease in prices as hedge funds are forced to sell off treasury positions. Now, um, we find some empirical evidence that's very consistent with this. This is not going to be surprising to people who have seen Fleckenstein and Longstaff that also look at this uh, trade from the perspective of broader uh, financial market frictions. Um, but in particular, it shows that uh, the returns on this trade respond to frictions in the repo markets, the dealer's treasury exposures, volatility, as well as margins on these futures contracts. Now. Um, but, a, a, you know, better laboratory or a more important laboratory for us is looking at what happens when this trade comes under stress. And to do that, we're going to look at this episode of Treasury Market Liquidity in March of 2020. We've already seen some um, presentations on this stuff. I'll just say that in general, you know, what seems to have happened during March of 2020 is that dealer balance sheets were already saturated with treasuries and they experienced a large dash for cash, which is you know, increase their treasury exposure 
and led to a rising cost of making markets for these dealers, which in turn raised uh, volatility in the treasury market. Now that increase in volatility had both direct and indirect effects on basis traders. So to look at the direct effects, if we look at the figure on the left here, what we're showing you is the margins that were set on this contract. Price changes made to a similar scale as the uh, contracts on this, uh, as the size of the contracts for futures. And we're also showing you the 95% interval for price changes over a two year period prior to the change. What we can see is that going into the early weeks of March, late weeks of February, there were price movements in this contract associated with that large volatility that were actually larger than what had been seen in the previous two years. Following those price movements, which actually breached the margins that the CBOT sets on these contracts, the uh, CBOT actually raised margins, and we can see that happening into uh, the middle of March, roughly. So all of that, that's materializing one side of the risks on hedge funds. If we look at the figure on the right, we can see some of the other side of risks. And in particular, I want you to concentrate on the DVP sponsored borrowing rate. And that rate is almost entirely made up of what hedge funds are uh, paying in this market. And we can see that, you know, following the decrease in the Fed funds rate, there was actually a pretty sizable spike up in the sponsored borrowing rate. And we'll show you in a little bit that that spike up was larger than in other segments of the repo market. Um, so that also means that hedge funds were experiencing some increased repo volatility during this period. When these two risks materialize, we find across a variety of different measures that hedge funds sold around $100 billion worth of uh, treasuries. And that's just coming from the hedge funds that are actually directly doing this basis trade. Um, now, we can also see the response of this in terms of prices. So the difference between these two blue lines and this gray line is what we report as our measure of the cash futures disconnect. And we can see that that was increasing during this period when volatility was high and when repo borrowing rates were also high. So all of this is suggestive evidence that hedge funds uh, actually exited this trade and indeed that these arbitrage spreads that they were enforcing through this trade actually uh, widened. But it doesn't really answer the question of what this did to broader treasury market functioning. And so to look at that, we're going to look at the prices of the treasuries that were most closely tied to the basis trade that is the cheapest to deliver treasuries for the futures contract. So what we're showing you in this panel is, is two things. And the figure on the left, we're showing you the disconnect or the difference in prices uh, between uh, a uh, difference in yields between a non-deliverable treasury and a cheapest to deliver treasury. Um, and that non-deliverable treasury that we're, we're, we're kind of constructing that based off of a simple yield curve fit on all treasuries not deliverable into futures contracts. Um, so what you're seeing during this period is that actually the prices of treasuries most closely tied to this trade are rising during this period of stress when hedge funds are selling a bunch of treasuries. Um, what you're seeing in the figure on the right is a sort of cross section of that fit. So in particular, we have the, the yield curve here as well as the yields on each individual treasury. What you can see is that the increase in the prices for cheapest to deliver treasuries is somewhat unique relative to other treasuries surrounding them. So all of this is suggested that despite the fact that hedge funds were offloading a bunch of these cheapest to deliver treasuries, their prices actually rose during March which implies that dealers were more willing to accept these treasuries than other non-deliverable, let's say, off-the-run treasuries. Um, now, we can think that this kind of makes sense, right? I mean, dealers tend to pay more for treasuries that, for which there's a natural source of demand and there's a lot of turnover on, and cheapest to deliver treasuries certainly fit that bill. Um, but, you know, one question is, you know, why did they continue to pay more for that despite the fact that this trade seems to have been declining amongst hedge funds? And what we think was going on here was that the Federal Reserve uh, intervened at exactly the right time. In particular, they intervened in, in, in two different ways. So the first was to provide a bunch of support through the repo facility, which we think decreased the cost of carrying treasuries uh, and especially cheapest to deliver treasuries. 
Now, if we look at the figure on the left here, we're, we're showing you the effects of that, that change. So all of these, uh, all of these rates are the, um, the green rate is sort of the rate that hedge funds are borrowing at in this market. The uh, dark blue rate is the rate at which dealers trade. And the light blue rate is the rate at which money market funds lend. In the panel below that down here, the green uh, amounts are the amounts in the repo facility and the blue amounts are the amounts in the reverse repo facility. So, you know, the repo facility is enforcing a ceiling on rates. The reverse repo facility is enforcing a floor. What we can see is that there are several periods here where the um, minimum bid rate on the repo facility was actually bid up beyond uh, 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 its lower bound. During those periods, we can where repo financing was relatively scarce, which are these gray bars here, we can see that repo rates were in general higher and particularly high for hedge fund borrowers. The last of these periods was around March uh, 15th or 16th, um, at which point the Fed actually increased the size of the repo facility dramatically. And we can see that following that increase, repo rates declined both across uh, different dealers and for um, hedge funds directly. The second thing that the Fed did was they took the unusual step of including cheapest to deliver uh, treasuries in their asset purchases uh, during this period. Now, what we're showing you over here is the total amount of purchases in each of those cheapest to deliver securities. And what you can see is that actually these purchases were not incredibly large during the period of the most stress for this trade, which was prior to April 1st. What we think that this um, inclusion of cheapest to deliver securities did instead was that it actually gave dealers an outside option should the trade not reemerge, they were able to actually, they could have confidence that they would be able to sell it to the Federal Reserve. So, um, all of this is, is sort of suggesting what we think was behind dealers' willingness to accept higher prices for treasuries that hedge funds were selling more of. So I'm just gonna conclude, I'm not really sure how I'm doing on time one way or the other. Um, so, you know, in the wake of, uh, doing good? All right, good. <laughs> so in the wake of, of March stress, um, you know, we've seen a lot of focus on, on hedge funds holdings of treasuries. We show you in this paper that a uh, substantial amount of those holdings, definitely the majority, can be associated with the cash futures basis trade. And so this specific arbitrage trade, whose returns seem to have risen during this period, um, was behind a lot of that uh, treasury exposure by hedge funds. Now, um, one thing that's important about that is that the trade is exposed to two specific sources of risk margins on the futures contract, as well as uh, risks associated with borrowing in the repo market, both of which seem to have materialized during March. Um, along this trade, hedge funds appear to uh, behave as, as warehouses for treasuries. They're taking them off of dealers' balance sheets and facilitating this risk sharing. And what we saw during March seems to have been that that warehousing role was impaired. But despite that impairment of the uh, to the warehousing ability of hedge funds, uh, we actually find that the uh, prices of cheapest to deliver securities increased, which suggests that the trade may have had a limited impact on overall treasury market liquidity, but that's only in the context of a large Fed intervention. And so, you know, going forward, we want to think carefully about the risks that this trade is um, creating and how it necessitates a possible intervention in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jay. Perfect. Uh, so um, the discussant is Loriana Bellizzon from Goethe University. Thank you very much, you know, to uh, giving me the opportunity to read this paper. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, just to make clear, it's 100 pages of paper with uh, 40 figures and, and 10, and 10, uh, uh, and 10 tables. So there is really a lot. And I think that, uh, uh, Jay really did a great job in presenting, you know, the main part of, of the paper, but there is really a lot. There is really a lot more in, in, in the paper. So what is the objective? So on one side, uh, among you know, the different analyses is to document the evolution of the US, U.S. Treasury future bond basis through time, not only for uh, the period of the March 2020, but really there are some analyses that start in 1992. 
and investigate who are exploiting these bases. And in particular, they are focusing on the role of the hedge funds on exploiting these bases in the recent, uh, let's say, three or four years. So clearly, they're also trying to figure out uh, if this is creating any issue about financial stability by focusing on the uh, turmoil uh, that we observed in the Treasury in March 2020. And I think that uh, they are giving really a very nice perspective on uh, what are the implications for financial stability of this type of uh, behavior by hedge funds. So the data, uh, they have a fantastic, let's say, several data. They are investigating several databases because clearly the basis is involving at least three markets, the treasury, the repo, and actually I'm talking about repos because uh, there are different type of repo market, the collateralized and the uncollateralized, uh, the clear and the unclear, sorry, and then uh, the future markets. So clearly they are using data on not only about this three market about price volumes and liquidity but on top of this they have also information about who are the traders in this market and pretty much uh, how much edge funds are holding of these three markets so this is why is making uh, they are able to make this paper quite unique because you know having the possibility to look to this market uh, in terms of you know price and volume but also on who is trading with whom is uh, uh, giving a, a, an important advantage in addressing the question that they are trying to address in this paper. So the result, as it has been already well presented by Jay, is that the basis trade becomes popular among hedge funds pretty much after the 2016. And uh, uh, among the other things that they are showing is that pretty much the basis trade is one of the reason of the uh, cheapest to deliver premium that is, has not been presented, but clearly is also another interesting result of the paper. And the basis trade is subject to treasury market liquidity risk, future margin calls, and repo rollover risk. And clearly, all these three aspects in March 2020 uh, may, in some sense, uh, have been materialized. But uh, what is also interesting in this paper is that they show that the unwinding of the basis by hedge funds since not having strongly contributed to the stress. Actually, it is the consequence of the stress that you observe, but uh, hedge funds and their trading on the basis uh, were not the cause of this stress. And this is also, I think, is one of the important results of this paper. So it's showing to us that clearly uh, this, uh, the hedge funds do trade a lot, the basis. They were unwinding it during the March 2020, but uh, maybe because of the intervention of the Fed, at the end, it doesn't seem that they were really the one creating at the beginning this, uh, uh, let's say, the problem of the turmoil that we observed in March 2020. We cannot exclude that if the Fed uh, didn't intervene, this basis trade may blow up and create a, a systemic risk, but so far, this is not what uh, uh, we observe, and they are able to document this, and I think that is quite credible. So, as I say, even if it is a very, it is a preliminary paper, it is extremely interesting, and there is really a lot of studies, a lot of analysis, a lot of results. To be, to be honest, uh, it's still difficult to digest, uh, and clearly, it needs to be more focused. And I think that they already, as you can see from the from the presentation, uh, the author are already going on the right path from this uh, point of view. Uh, but clearly, I have several questions. The first one is clearly uh, the basis trade becomes popular among hedge funds. This is what they document mostly in 2016, 17, and so on. And one question that I have in general is: Is it good or bad? You know, pretty much uh, they are not the one that generate this basis from 2016, actually, if they are playing a role in the market, apart from the turmoil that then we can discuss, is that they have a positive role. They are the arbitrageurs and they prevent that this, this connection among these two markets, future and cash, is becoming even bigger. So, you know, I think really that we need to consider the hedge fund and the, play, the role that they play on the basis, at least for the period before the, uh, the, the March 2020, as those that, in some sense, prevent this disconnection to become even bigger. And maybe, you know, uh, 
it would be nice that this aspect is, is stressed a little bit more. And we need to ask to ourselves, if this role has not been played by edge funds, what should be the others that play this role? Because clearly there are market forces that create this disconnection and edge funds are not the one creating this disconnection. So uh, maybe take a, a general perspective and, and recognize the role of the edge funds in really reducing this disconnection should be important. You know, in the paper, there are this, paper, this figure that already shows this, let's say, this increase in the basis, mostly in the last part of the sample. Actually, this is calculated with the, the second to deliver contract, and I wonder why. But anyway, there is this huge increase in the open interest position, largely documented by the paper that this open interest position has been taken by, on one side, some long-term investor, and some, on the other side, by, uh, by edge funds. But clearly, the first mover are not the edge funds. The first mover are the other long-term investors that want to take position on the interest rate, treasury interest rate, and the hedge funds on one side provide the liquidity to the future market, and on the other side, you know, they are taking this open interest position. So clearly, they are really the consequence of this type of behavior, not the cause. And uh, so, you know, since he thinks that they are the consequence and uh, there are several other reasons why this basis has been increased, long-term investor supplementary leverage ratio. In some sense, uh, uh, you know, we need really to ask to ourselves uh, uh, if the basis were also present before, because this is what this graph is showing, you know. Also in terms of size, is what quite similar to the one that we observed in 2019, 2020. It was very large in 2016. And maybe it was also present in 2012, 2013, both for the two year and also for the five years. So I think that the question is, why H funds started in 2016? The bases were present even before, the size was similar, why they're not, were not exploiting it before? And, uh, and if this is not the case, you know, who kept the bases more before the 2016 and then uh, you know, the edge funds came in. Maybe some other primary dealer that now have the supplementary leverage ratio, but still it seems that it was enough because, you know, the bases were present even before. So what is going here? I think that if we want really to have a paper that try to explain these bases and uh, how it's moving, we need to have, uh, as they are doing in the paper, a long-term perspective. So look for a long period, not just to try to explain only one single event and try to give a broad uh, view. And this is exactly what I think it will be interesting to, to observe. That is, you know, who are the agents that push the market versus the disconnection through time? And the paper clearly is investigating the basis from 1922 till 2020. Do we need different theories to explain the different times where the basics spike up to be positive, some cases negative? And can we have a uni unified uh, theory that is able to explain, uh, you know, it in the equal way through time? Because, you know, we do have the LTCF that creates this, that where in some sense trying to exploit this large basis also in 1997, 1996, and then blow up in 1998. So is it the same story? Is it a different story? From my point of view, you know, we have that the story that can explain all this disconnection is that there are some reason why there is a huge, let's say, difference in the demand or in the supply in the two markets, future or treasury, this large demand or supply can be both in one market, but not in the other. This is the key point. So this is the first mover. And then clearly there are the arbitrageurs that try to connect these two markets, but this arbitrage is not really a, a risk-free arbitrage. It's not an arbitrage actually at the end, because you need to take rollover risk, margin call. And this is something that we know for decades. This was the problem that LTCM faces. And, you know, for example, we have a paper that in Europe, we have a similar problem 
where the mispricing has been created by the QE uh, of, of the central bank. So, you know, the fact is that there are some times where there is this disconnection because there is some trade that trade only in one of these markets and not in the other, and the arbitrageurs do not have the capacity or do have the capacity, but still the disconnection remains because you have these two risks, the repo cost, the rollover risk of the repo cost, and the margin call. So you have a model that try to explain this in general, and it would be nice to see if this is the only reason of why we have this type of disconnection or there is some other story. Then going back instead on, uh, on the case that you are presenting, that is the March 2020, you know, there is this graph in your, uh, in your paper among the different figures that is, you know, in some sense, puzzling the, 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 how pretty much these hedge funds has to face the risk during the March 2020. Because as you can see, the price initially increased and they were short on, on the future. So they were losing on the future side. Then the market crashed and they are losing on the bond side. So, you know, the question is, uh, what's happened really to, to this, uh, uh, from the point of view of the, of the basis, which of these two events were the, the, the one creating more problem to them? The increase in the price, so on the future side, or the reduction in the price on the cash side? And I think, you know, that uh, in some sense, what the market faces in that case, it was a fly to safety at the beginning, and then a fly to cash. Clearly, the Fed intervened at the fly to cash to prevent a, a larger reduction in the price. But there was also a rolling up in the price before, and the hedge funds clearly trading the basis face the risk on both sides. So during the flight uh, to cash, the hedge, fund, the hedge fund trading, the base might have help on one side, you know? They were short on the future position and they are earning on the, uh, uh, and they're in the earning in this case, because you know, when there is the cash, the crash, having a short position on, on the future, we're helping them to make money. So, you know, I think that you should investigate even if it is a few days, these two events, the flight to safety and the flight to cash separate, maybe by looking to more high frequency data, and then try to see really uh, what was the role. Because from my point of view, at least for some fraction of, of the turmoil, they were providing liquidity to the market. They were actually not the one that can create financial instability. They were helping the market. So it would be nice to see better what was really the role of hedge funds. And, you know, you are having this policy implication that, uh, you know, the, the intervention of the Fed prevent that uh, the, uh, the position of the hedge funds in the, tra in, the, in the basis might have created a lot of financial instability. Uh, but to be honest, it is not clear to me if the solution for the uh, risk that the basis trade is creating should be really that the central bank is becoming the market maker of last resort. We need to think how to eliminate this, sense, this friction and allow the arbitrageur to do their work. But, you know, we shouldn't all the time to ask for the intervention of the central bank. You know, uh, clearly this is not an arbitrage, a risk-free arbitrage. The arbitrageur trading this basis are carrying risk, the rolling over risk, the liquidity risk, and the margin call. So clearly, you know, while we are not trying to eliminate the, uh, the rollover risk by having a more long-term repo market, why, we, why is not present so far? This is the type of question we need to ask. And why is not centrally clear and net the position both of the future market and the repo market? This will eliminate completely the risk. We will have that the market is efficient and the two markets will be less disconnected. So trying to address also this type of, of issue will tell us how to address the problem and avoid that all the problems we have in the market are solved by the central bank. Uh, then I have clearly several other points that maybe we can discuss. Yes, on, if you, you could know. wrap up yes. then. Yes, so you know there are clearly uh, some issue about the regression that has been done, uh, 
and also you know the model is interesting i have a lot of other questions regarding the model but i prefer not to spend time given that also you didn't spend time on on the model but clearly it is a very interesting paper i'm learning a lot to be honest i have a lot of other questions after reading 100 pages of the paper but uh, you know in any case very good job and a lot you did a, a great uh you, you did you did spend a lot of time i can imagine a lot of work in uh, developing all these type of analysis thank you very much uh, thank you very much doriana so first i would like to give to jay the possibility to respond i mean yeah. Loriana made a lot of points so maybe yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, a couple I'm trying of to tackle the, the, the big ones uh thank you for, for going through the paper i know it's a little bit uh, disorganized and, and we are working on that um, you know, in terms of, I, I think there's a very good point here, first of all, on, on the central bank interventions and also on the sort of what, what value are the hedge funds providing to this trade? Like, why is it, let's say, are they playing a useful role here, right? I, I think that it is absolutely the case that the presence of these large, you know, arbitrage spreads has to do with a broader treasury market structure. Right. And, and I think that it is a, a thing that we have wanted to point out is essentially that it's not that hedge funds decided to take massive levered positions out of nowhere. They did it because the treasury market structure was set up in a certain way. And, you know, I think you're exactly right that a straightforward policy response is to address the treasury market structure and not to just allow hedge funds to build up these positions and then get ready to to bail them out every time. Excuse me, excuse me not that, but uh, <laughs> provide support uh, when they when they get into trouble. Um, so I, I think that's all uh, completely true. I think that you know um, netting um, across futures and uh, repo markets, for instance, is is, is a, would be a big step to eliminating these spreads. Um, it wouldn't necessarily eliminate risk. Because you know, then we have some risk between the two, you know, between say CME and 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 FIC on the other side that they now have to um, uh, net out. So that's that's a possibility, but but it, it's still the case that it seems like a, a good first step. Um, as does increasing, you know, the scope of central clearing, that might also have a big effect here. Um, so yeah, I, I think all of that is, is very true. I mean trying to see if I am sure I have missed something. Oh, who should play the role of hedge funds don't? It's a great question. We've been thinking a lot of this in terms of banks being the alternative. And you know, the reason we've been thinking of that is sort of, there's an element of this that's classic maturity or liquidity transformation that you think should be the realm of traditional banks or dealers. Um, the fact that they haven't been doing that, liquidity transformation may have to do with you know, let's say changes in regulation or other frictions in the treasury market that have increased over time. And the unfortunate thing is we don't we don't know what the, the shape of the ownership of, you know, treasury futures or cash positions. Like our hedge fund data starts in 2013. Uh, the commitment of traders data, I don't remember when it starts, but it definitely, I don't believe, goes back to 1992. So, you know, we have a limited window and we can set up a model that sort of makes sense of treasury market structure as of 2019. But I don't think that we can apply it equally to all, all dates. Uh, and I agree that, you know, I agree that I want to apply it to more places and, and make a more stable uh, structure here and especially explain the, the rise in this, which we think is either coming from the fact that, you know, cash treasuries are becoming harder to hold on balance sheets or because you know the other side, the futures um, side, has more demand for that uh, off balancing exposure from the contract. But you know we haven't found a way to make a very good causal statement on which one of those was important and by how much. Uh, and I think making that statement would be a great thing to do. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to do it in this paper by itself, um, especially since it would increase the page count, which would you know. Uh, I think uh, give my co-author uh, nightmares. So, you know, uh, but in any case, I hope I got most of it. Uh, thank you very much for that discussion. It was, it was great.
So. Th thank you, Jay. Okay, uh, we're a bit late, but I want to give to whoever has a question that would like to ask the possibility to intervene. I don't see anything in the chat, but if you have a question then would like to ask this question directly, if you can. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> so then, thank you very much, Jay. Thank you very much, Loriana.